Dear listeners, this is a special announcement. The episode of Foreign Correspondence, Deeper into Hitchcock Podcast, that you are about to listen to, was recorded on the 21st of June, 2022. On the 4th of July, 2022, we received the news of the passing of Alain kerzon the co-author of the book Hitchcock Lost and Found, The Forgotten Films. The episode you are about to listen to contains a conversation with the other co-author of the book, Charles Barr. The conversation was conducted via Zoom. The pioneering scholarship of Alain kerzon on Aventure Malgache and Bon Voyage, the two wartime Hitchcock shorts that we are discussing in this episode, was absolutely crucial in appreciating those films as important parts of the Hitchcock oeuvre. We dedicate this episode of our podcast to the memory of Alain kerzon with the only two words that seem appropriate. Bon voyage. <laughs> Welcome to the 30th episode of Foreign Correspondence Deeper into Hitchcock Podcast. My name is Michał Leszczyk and I'm joined as always by my co-host Sebastian Smoliński. Hello. Yes, it's quite incredible. This is the 30th episode. So yes, we've been doing this for the past three years. It's a slow moving project, but... uh, lovingly crafted project so that's all i can say so we are about to engage in some true hitchcock geekdom by uh, devoting the whole episode to two short films that uh, hitchcock made uh, short films which used to be actually unavailable but are now beautifully available for example on the Eureka uh, Blu-ray of Lifeboat, name, namely two shorts that Hitchcock made during World War II, two propaganda shorts, Aventure Malgache and Bon Voyage, both from 1944. These are the two films that he made as part of a war effort. These are films that were made in England, but sh- uh, shot actually in French. Uh, so these are the only foreign language pictures that Hitchcock ever uh, ever made. And uh, yes, and so we are about to discuss them. Yeah, except for like German version of murder or something like that, right? In the, right, in the and Marie, period. Marie, right? The, mm-hmm. uh, yes, uh, absolutely, you're right, absolutely. Uh, don't forget that he used to be a continental filmmaker, especially when he was uh, strongly engaged with the pre-war German film industry. However, uh, these are two films that we will discuss with a very special guest, and because you clicked on the episode, you already know who the guest will be, but we are so thrilled about this guest actually saying yes to our invitation that let's withhold his name just for a moment. We just want to mention that those two films are wildly available. Uh, You can purchase the, as I said, the Eureka Masters of Cinema Blu-ray of uh, Lifeboat and the the two shorts are there. And actually there's a wonderful booklet also with great essays about those two films. And uh, Bon Voyage is really, both are short, they're about 25 minutes long each, each. And uh, Bon Voyage is a wartime thriller about espionage and treason. Uh, And uh, Aventure Malgache is a film, actually a thriller comedy, I would say, Mm -hmm. about um, a group of actors who are preparing to uh, play in a, to act in a play. And they recount an act of wartime treason in French occupied or French colonized Madagascar. So these are the the two films. And before we start uh, our conversation with our guest, I I can I have to honestly say that I've never been as excited about the guest on this show. This is a man who has written what I consider to be an absolutely the best uh, Hitchcock book, which is um, English Hitchcock. And it's Charles Barr, who actually said yes, and uh, who will discuss those two films with us in a moment. Charles Barr, yes, whose um, book English Hitchcock may be the most important for us at the moment. But my memory is that the first British Film Institute book, the first BFI classic I've ever read was his Vertigo book. 
So when I realized that, I got a bit intimidated, but Professor Barr reached out to us, actually, uh, saying a few kind words about our podcasts, which also made our day, as you can imagine. And he agreed to join us uh, for a very unique, very special conversation on these two war shorts. Uh, Professor Barr is now Professor Emeritus, uh, but his career in film studies spans more than 50 years. He's one of the most important figures in uh, Anglophone film studies. And his books also include uh, volumes on Ailing Studios and uh, books on British cinema. He has also one upcoming book and we'll ask him about, about this one. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I, I just will mention that I do remember when those two films surfaced because the, it was mid or late 90s and they were um, released on video, on VHS, and this is the first time that I saw them. Uh, it was quite a thrill, but uh, the real thrill is to see them restored on the Blu-ray that I mentioned. So uh, I definitely recommend the Blu-ray and uh, without further ado, let's discuss Aventure Malgache and Bon Voyage with Professor Charles Barr. Today uh, we would love to discuss two films, two short films by by Hitchcock, which are probably, well, not probably, definitely his least seen uh, works, which is uh, Bon Voyage and uh, Aventure uh, Malgache. Uh, When we think of uh, British war films, British Second World War propaganda films, where can we place those two short films by Hitchcock? We, we are aware of works by Powell and Pressburger, Contraband, one of our aircraft is missing, of uh, you know, David Lean, yeah. in which we serve. Where, where do we even put those two short, strange short films by Hitchcock on the map? Did they have the same kind of impact or, or maybe less so? Where, where would you place them? Well, I think um, uh, probably a more appropriate comparison would be some of the great short films which were made in, within British propaganda cinema of World War II, uh, notably those by by Humphrey Jennings. Uh, I don't know if you know those films, Listen to Britain, um, uh, Fires Were Started, which is a longer documentary film. Uh, but but there's a... And, artists like Len Lai, who of course worked with Hitchcock on Secret Agent briefly, um, and some films written by Dylan Thomas, the poet. There's a very rich culture of short films made in Britain in in World War II. Uh, But I don't think um, the two Hitchcock short films that you referred to have any relation to or any significant comparison with them, because they were made for for France. They're made in France for French. uh, They're made, sorry, they're made in French for French audiences. And I don't think they were shown in Britain at all, other than just to the, the people who'd commissioned them and to the authorities and to um, uh, and certain military people who had to discuss whether they were useful to be shown in France, but they were, they were made absolute, They were made in a British studio, but absolutely for the French market. So I don't think there's any comparison with Paul Pressburg or David Lean or even Humphrey Jennings. One, one, one more question and I give it over to Sebastian. Uh, I'm curious because there, there's this uh, element to those films that, that, that we understand that at least partly it was this attempt on Hitchcock's part to sort of make up for leaving England, that, that you know he left for Hollywood. There were some very bitter comments about that, also from Michael Balkan. So, so it was almost like you know this act of actually joining the, the effort. My, my question is, was the British film industry at that time, the people of the industry, aware of this Hitchcock effort that he made? That was it registered? Did they say, oh, yeah, he came back, you know, he, he made those films, we, we forgive him for leaving, or was it something that was, you know, sort of on, on, on the, you know, sidetrack, that, that, that they weren't aware of it that much? Yeah, I'm not sure how much publicity they had. I, I ought to be able to answer that. Bon Voyage had a very good reception in France. It's sometimes said that the two films were failures. But Bon Voyage, it's it's on record, it was shown widely in France, and it had a, a very positive reception by uh, writers in 1944, by writers and cinema managers. It was one of the most 
successful films with audiences of, of a propaganda short film time in France. It wasn't shown in Britain. Now, I don't know if his, um, if Hitchcock's associates were aware of those films strongly um, or, or, or saw them, but certainly um, one person who was aware of them was their editor, Alan Osbiston who became a, a distinguished editor and he um, signed a film, um, Chance of a Lifetime, which is a rather good film of 1950 or so. He's one of the editors who went into uh, directing briefly. He had a co-director credit there. And he was a good professional editor. And he was um, sent, he went out to America, to New York, uh, in order to edit the films. Hitchcock had shot the films, planned the films and shot the films, went back to America to prepare Spellbound. And I think the war was still going on then. Uh, this was, yes, this would have been 44. And Osbiston went out and he said he had a wonderful uh, relationship with Hitchcock, who was absolutely professionally committed to those two films. And Osbiston uh, and he said he learned a lot from them and he did a great job on them, these two very compact films. And then Osbiston went back. So he was a member of um, the British film industry and a member of the Technicians Union, who would have spoken very positively about Hitchcock. And he, he Hitchcock worked for... Um, several weeks um, preparing the films and then several weeks shooting the films at well in studios. So he, would, he met a number of people who've gone on record of saying how committed he was to those projects. So I think, I think the answer, my answer would be, first of all, um, Hitchcock, uh, his reputation was pretty good by then. Uh, if, I, I think the resent, the question of the resentment of Hitchcock for going to the States uh, it's, it's possible to exaggerate that. Um, uh, there were a number of people who spoke out uh, strongly uh, and rather rashly, perhaps, uh, in 1940, uh, notably Balkan, but other people like J.B. Priestley and Seymour Hicks, who Hitchcock had worked with at a very early stage. Um, and they were well-known figures, and they put their name to this uh, statement saying that um, uh, it was disgraceful that a number of people uh, had gone to America and had not come back where they should be coming to um, help the war effort either directly through fighting, uh, which you obviously don't expect Hitchcock to do at his age and with his bulk, um, but indirectly and in supporting the film industry. Uh, but uh, Hitchcock, even at the time, he answered that strongly, powerfully, uh, both by writing, saying that he felt he could do a more useful job in neutral America, in working for the British cause in neutral America, and then by making films like Foreign Correspondent. You know, not everybody liked Foreign Correspondent, but it was a big success, and it's obviously a huge... I haven't listened to the podcast on Foreign Correspondent, and, of course, you've adopted the name, haven't you? Um, we like uh, the film. And it's a terrific film film and a very powerful film mm -hmm. and it 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 went down very strongly in Britain and um you know you don't need to you don't need to defend Hitchcock after he's done that he's shown that he can make a film which makes a, a much stronger impact in America and elsewhere and including in Britain a stronger impact than anybody any British films were making at that time uh, so I think the case, he's answered the case by then, but there's still some lingering. I'm sure there's some lingering resentment of Hitchcock when he stays in the, in the States and makes films which aren't anything to do with the war. I think Balkan uh, didn't care for him making films like Mr. and Mrs. Smith. You know, how's that helping the British war effort? But then he... Uh, made of saboteur, obviously, and then lifeboat. So, uh, going back to your question, I'd say I'm not sure how much impact those two films made on the British film community more widely than the people who'd worked with um, Hitchcock at Wellin or on the editing. Uh, but equally, I don't think he needed to um, save his reputation by then. Thank you for that. And maybe we can share with our listeners the information. What is the direct reason why uh, you agreed to join us for this particular episode? So the, the direct reason, I think, is that we were emailing with each other. And thank you 
publicly for your support, for your uh, warm reception of, of uh, certain episodes of this podcast. This is very nice. And uh, we discovered that we will probably contribute together to the same book. I mean, we already did contribute. You yes. as a very established and famous, you know, Hitchcock scholar that I've been uh, studying to write my own um, experimental article, we could say, uh, on The Lodger. And you contributed your chapter on, on these shorts. Uh, the book will have a title One Shot Hitchcock, right? Uh, One Shot Hitchcock, yes. So the, the idea is that each author is starting his or her own essay with a single single shot from, from a Hitchcock film. You chose uh, a shot from Aventure Mag Malgash, right? Uh, why did you decide to, to focus on these relatively, as you mentioned at the beginning, obscure shorts that not many people have seen, that you know are not as thrilling as his great works from the British or American period? Why these two shorts for this book? Well, I think one one reason was uh, that I came quite late to the project. I can't remember how I how I heard about it or if I was invited as an afterthought or something. But I did come quite late to the project, and I was aware that a, a lot of films had already been taken, mm -hmm. as it were. And uh, I've had the pleasure of previewing um, Tom Gunning's chapter, for instance, on the Manx Man. Uh, which uh, he, he chooses the wonderful shot in the Manxman where the uh, the judges at the end the judge's pen dips into the inkwell and there's a dissolve from the, the the water into which his lover Aniondra has tried to drown herself in a, a dissolve to the inkwell and you know that's that's a perfect shot to take off from write about in detail uh, partly because it is so eloquent about female male uh, the woman the des desperate woman the rather horrible man uh, dipping his pen into the inkwell to sort of try to um, anyway I needn't go into that uh, but uh, and it it um, enables you to make connections with psycho and the plug hole etc the dissolve there uh, so a lot a lot of films were taken and I suppose I just was wanting to be a little bit perverse and not um, I'm sure there were other films I could have written about but I think that it, it was quite a challenge to think to try to present um, this completely unknown film and to rescue uh, or to try to give some attention to this completely unknown film, because I think it's Bon Voyage was shown widely at the time. Um, uh, Mountain Eagle, Lost Now, was shown quite widely at the time, but nobody saw Aventure Malgache because it was, um, uh, it was banned. The French didn't like it because it showed divisions in, in the French resistance, whereas Bon Voyage showed the, um, the French resistance as, as working strongly together um, and managing to, dis to um, uh, eliminate uh, traitors um, with it within the organization. Um, but uh, yeah, so Aventure Malgache was undoubtedly a Hitchcock film, which everyone, including the editor, said he absolutely put himself into very seriously, um, as seriously as, as he was, as the films that he was preparing at the time, Spellbound and then Notorious. Uh, but, um, uh, and I think you can learn a lot about Hitchcock from it. I hope I've mm -hmm. shown, shown that or been able to argue that. It, it is a very interesting, I think, example of Hitchcock's transitional style um, when he's moving from a montage-based cinema uh, the, the sort of classic Hitchcock montage based cinema um, towards the long take films, uh, which are going to come after the war, notably, of course, Rope and Under Capricorn. Uh, that the most memorable parts of Aventure Malagash, I think, are the long takes, the very studied long takes, particularly a uh, long take that culminates in a, a memorable telephone uh, moment. And then the long take, which I actually chose to, to, to illustrate, uh, picking that, that out from the film, uh, which is a triangular shot uh, with great triangular tension of two, an antagonist and protagonist at either side of the screen. And in the background, this uh, unexplained and unspeaking black soldier, um, who must have been quite, I wonder where they got 
I wonder who he was and where they got him in um, England in 19, early 1944. Uh, we know where he got the French people because they were French people who were working in in London at the time they and connected with the Free French and the French theatre in uh, putting on the Moliere players in London, exiled French uh, anti-Nazi figures. But who's this? Where did they get this black actor or black soldier to stand in the background for this in this long shot? And I, I, I chose that that and the film partly because I find that composition so so interesting uh, as a, a foreshadowing of the kind of interesting long takes that Hitchcock will do in particularly Rope and Under Capricorn, but here and there in, in other other films and I think there's a political subtext to that um, and uh, that, that Hitchcock has just come from making Lifeboat which is the I think the only film in which he has a black actor credited on screen is that right Canada Lee yes. who's an important figure in Lifeboat and that's significant for the later stages of the war when you know the uh, black soldiers are are very important to the American war effort and to some extent to the British one with various um, uh, Caribbean contingents in the British army and so on. Uh, and um, he, he moves on from lifeboat and has this strangely prophetic black figure in the background. And I, uh, one, one reason I wanted to look at that was it's and this is one reason for being interested in these two films, is that, um, to, to repeat, Hitchcock was absolutely committed to these films. He came across the Atlantic, uh, quite a dangerous thing to do. He worked at a, a really low-level studio, well-in studios, which was nothing like the Hollywood that he was now accustomed to, and it wasn't even like Shepherd's Bush and then Pinewood, where he'd made his 30s films. It didn't have their sort of facilities. Uh, and yet he clearly was very um, committed politically and also aesthetically uh, to crafting these films. And then in 58, uh, it, it's extraordinary that in 1958, when he's preparing North by Northwest, uh, he whistles up these two films and says he's planning, working with Ennis Lehman on preparing North by Northwest. And I just get this from um, McGilligan's biography, uh, where he says, let's have a look at these films. And he thinks of remaking Bon Voyage, but, but he doesn't remake it, but he does use uh, the key plot point of Bon Voyage for a key, key plot point in North by Northwest, there's no question of that because they uh, are well known to have agonized, how are we going to end North by Northwest? We've got this far, we've got them to Rushmore. How do we kind of resolve it? And Ernest Lehman said, I suddenly had this wonderful bright idea. She gets out the gun and shoots him. But they've been watching Bon Voyage, which hinges on the fact that uh, a German agent has shot another German agent. And they think, oh, well, he can't be a German. They don't suspect him. And then when it's revealed that he was a German agent, the, the naive English or Scottish hero, hero says, um, but why would, a, why would a Gestapo agent shoot his own man? Well, it's to sort of, uh, they, they're ruthless like that, but it convinces people that they weren't, um, that they're not, a, that they're on our side. And that's exactly what Eva Marie Saint does in shooting Carrie Brandt. As um, James Mason says in the film, they just freshened, it's an old Gestapo trick, they just freshened it up a bit with fake bullets. But it, it must come from that because we know Hitchcock rescreened the film in 58. And I think that um, they also saw Aventure Malgache with this confrontation left and right of screen, very. Uh, very starkly composed with the black man in the background who is kind of reminds you that this is a colonial, a French colonial 
place, which is part of the problem that they're dealing with in Aventure Malgache, it's the French colonialism. And there's going to be a re revolt in 1957, leading up eventually to independence in 1960. And in North by Northwest, there's this wonderful scene at the United Nations with Cary Grant confronting uh, uh, George, no, um, what's his name, Townsend. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're sort of blocked either side of the screen, just like the two characters in Aventure Malgache. And in the background, there's this West African delegation who are visiting the United Nations. And the reason that Cary Grant is becomes the number one suspect known throughout America for his face is that the um, the African delegation is being photographed uh, to celebrate their visit to the United Nations and the cameraman is able to when he hears the shot he turns around and takes a picture of Cary Grant so the crucial plot moment depends on these unexplained harbingers of uh, decolonization, because this is the moment of decolonization, 1959, the eve of the 60s, the decade of decolonization. And Hitchcock uh, is well on record as supporting the United Nations. Um, he was ready to make a short film in the 60s, supporting the ideals of the United Nations. So I think it's it's fascinating the way that a film like Aventure Malgache, even though it's it's unseen. Um, Hitchcock was trying out certain things um, uh, that he could store away and uh, use both uh, playing with long take techniques, it, which he does in uh, here and there in Aventura Malgache. There's a lot of long takes which seem to forecast um, be part of his preparation, as it were, for Rope and Under Capricorn, but also that kind of little political snapshot of in the background is the future of, of uh, Black um, decolonization in the case of Madagascar, you know, off, well, it's off Africa, isn't it? And um, uh, the delegates are said in the script to be from West Africa to the United Nations. That's all, and maybe that's all a bit fanciful, but um, I think um, that's that's one of the reasons, you asked me the reason for choosing those films, it's partly kind of perversity, let's take these completely unknown films. But also I'd had such a good time working with Alain, my French colleague um, in Hitchcock Lost and Found, and I think he he came up with a with a lot of information about the films. He'd, he'd written an article about Aventure Malgache, in Senses of Cinema. That was one of the starting points for the book. And um, I think he probably produced the films and gave me a copy of them and we worked together. Um, so, and Hitchcock Lost and Found is not a film, uh, not a book with enormous circulation. Mm -hmm. And I thought, uh, let's go back to these films and give them a renewed kind of circulation. Just to comment on what you just said, we often joke with Sebastian that you know, there, there's an infinite um, amount of books that can be written about Hitchcock simply by focusing on those, you know, different areas of of his work. And I and I just thought that maybe there is a book uh, to be written, uh, you know, about the geopolitical uh, uh, Hitchcock, because uh, uh, immediately, you know, also when reading your article, I thought of the second uh, Man Who Knew Too Much, which mm -hmm. takes place in Morocco, Marrakesh, Marrakesh yes. Mar Morocco. And, and we have this, those very innocent American couple, uh, family, really, who, who are completely clueless about the culture uh, there. And, and But this is also a colonial, this is a colonial uh, terrain uh, with heavy French, uh, French um, uh, influence. And, and of course, in Topaz and uh, Torn Curtain, Hitchcock yes. Yes. immediately, I mean, uh, fully engages with issues of colonial power, especially... You know, if, if you if you look at Eastern Europe, which is our you know part of the world, definitely the Soviet influence was a colonial influence. So so that's also an interesting, interesting uh, I think avenue of possible um, well, inquiry. Good thing to do do in the future. You've got more time left. Uh, you never know. You never know. We never, yes, but, but the, the the title of our podcast maybe is important. Yeah. Of that, but ju just one more question. A question about uh, Avantu Mar Malgash. Uh, how how do you read the, the sort of the theatrical uh, quotation mark around the whole uh, thing? You know, with the actors preparing to play out the very 
treacherous drama that they just described to us. Is, is, do you see this as something very typical of uh, Hitchcock's approach? Because basically we can see the actors preparing to play, you know, the yes. villain. And so uh, uh, could you comment maybe on this uh, aspect of it? Well, I think uh, Hitchcock was... Um, he was very devoted to the theater and very formed by the theater in, in youth, especially. I don't know how much he went to the theater um, when he was based in Los Angeles. Does anybody um, study that much? I think he went quite, he went in on his visit to New York. He would have gone to the theater, he, Broadway. Uh, but he was an absolute, he was passionate about English theater of the, uh, of the t particularly of the 1920s. Uh, of of his twenties, um, and he's he's quoted on that uh, a, a great deal. I think John Russell Taylor says how much he loved to talk about the theatre of his youth and to to bring out people whom he remembered from the theatre of his youth, like Catherine Nesbitt in his very last film, Frenzy. Catherine Nesbitt uh, sent for because basically he remembered her as a young as a young actress and she was still around so he got her out to Hollywood for family plot um that that and that does get into his film practice doesn't it I'm thinking of murder for instance the, the lovely backstage scenes in murder where it's there's right. conversations going on and you're not sure uh, and it sort of bleeds <laughs> um the, the, the actors are involved in conversation and they have to do their go off and do their moment in the play and then they come back again. A lo lovely sort of playful uh, uh, interaction of, of theatre and, uh, and film, so theatre and reality. And then the whole theme of murder, of acting out of Day of Hamlet and Hitchcock wanted to make Hamlet with Cary Grant, didn't he? And then um, stage fright. Uh, am I right in remembering that she said to Francois Truffaut, the thing that attracted me was that it was about the theatre. Mm -hmm. So theatre, he, he liked, he, he, he was influenced by playwrights and theatre, particularly uh, J.M. Barry, and I'll come back if you'll allow me in a moment in, to, to J.M. Barry. Uh, his, his long, um, yes, and also he, he liked the, uh, the, the, the play of theatre. Um, the whole business of putting on an act and trying to decipher what what people were presenting uh, rope you know the the, the 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 not just the theatrical origins and the theatrical sort of treatment theatrical time um, in the film but also the uh, the the show that the characters put on that they're putting on a performance uh, a daring performance, and uh, and then is is the performance going to collapse and be seen through? Can 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 the audience, can the uh, James Short figure, etc., work out uh, behind the theatrical display what is happening? Um, so I think Hitch Hitchcock really enjoyed that. There's, first of all, he uses the Molière players. So they're integral to the concept of Aventure Malgache because he uses so many of them. We, we found out for Hitchcock Lost and Found that there was this performance, uh, I think this is still in, in the book, um, of the Molière players in London in December 1943, just after Hitchcock had arrived in London, he must have gone to that performance because he casts, he's already working with a couple of them, uh, including Paul Boniface, he's sort of part of the package. And then there's some people in small parts, Paulette Prenet, is that right? And Emma Soiron, uh, that you find he's taken the cast mainly from that theatrical performance. And then what's, what better than to foreground them in the film? and to kind of uh, enact, he can't go to Madagascar, he can't tap into what is really happening in Madagascar, but he can have the, uh, the cast, including some people who know Madagascar, particularly the central character, who's, who's reenacting his role in the real Madagascar, playing it on stage, and then equally playing it on film. I think there's a fascinating sort of oscillation between the theatre and film and the, the basic reality of what's going on in Madagascar very 
neatly done. And so the, the this unknown film, well, it's not unknown anymore because you can get it on DVD. Maybe one day it will be fully celebrated with criteria and edition and all that. But pending that, it is, I think it is very, um, don't you think, interesting film? Mm, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yes, definitely. And, and, um, I wanted to follow on what you said earlier. There is certain, I, I would say, sting in these in these shorts, which you uh, describe very well in your essay. Uh, the sting, I mean, the the vision of both the French nation and kind of these premonitions that are there. You mentioned that this triangle may also be interpreted as, and I like this idea a lot, representing past, which is the the Vichy collaborators, present, the French liberation and the future, which is decolonization. But also I think the sting is there um, when you think about documentaries, for example, about the French collaboration that were to appear uh, later on, I would say. Uh, the Sorrow and the Pity, of course, is the probably the most the famous. One, yes, yeah. the mo from the 60s, I think, right? Late 60s. And Yes, and then this uh, year before Clouseau made Le Corbeau, right? Which exactly. is also a oh. metaphor of, of yeah. collaboration. Yeah, Clouseau. So this 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 sour vision actually. So Hitchcock is asked to make these propaganda shorts celebrating French resistance, but as you write in your essay, these films are pretty sour. And of course, uh, on our um, from the Polish perspective, even Bon Voyage is a bit sour with um, a Polish Polish hero who turns out to be a Gestapo, right, officer. So. But, so, but he's not he's not Polish ultimately. I mean he's, yes, yes. he's posing as a Pole. Yes. He's posing as a Pole, yes. There are some good British films uh with positive Polish characters in World War Two, aren't there? Uh, a Bridge Too Far, for example, with Gene Hackman uh, playing a Polish general. Yes. <laughs> uh, I was I was thinking of wartime. I don't like that. Wartime. Film. Oh, okay. But wartime I, I, I films. Think, there's yes. some um uh -huh. uh well there's dangerous moonlight, isn't there? Oh, there you are. There you are. I, I, and, so, I, and some other ones as well. Some, some I mean, other. There's another book to be written solely mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. that, I guess. But th this may, may be a smooth transition to Bon Voyage, actually, which can we focus on? Because, you know, this podcast was born out of the idea that, you know, two Eastern European film buffs and critics can look at Hitchcock from, from our own perspective. And here, here we are. We have a film in which there is a Polish character, at least until the very end of the film, we think it's a Polish character. Then it right. turns out it's actually a German, a German posing as a as, as a Pole. But, but 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 to me, actually, out of those two films, I think uh, Bon Voyage is probably the one that could be perfectly. I, I can imagine it being remade right now. I mean, as as, as you yeah. know, as this wartime thriller. With you know, with this first half being told in this very straightforward way, and then we go again, you know, through the through the events of the film, only yes. from us. It's very it's like modern. Pre Rashomon structure and so yeah, on. Yeah, I right? can imagine Chris, yeah. Christopher Nolan, you know, making yeah. his version of this. Uh, of the and you can understand why Hitchcock really did like the idea of remaking it. Okay, he folded a bit of it into North by Northwest, and but you can understand that North, the director of North by Northwest, could make that as a feature film, as you say, adapting the short film into a feature film, and could do it today if he was around. Yeah. What are your feelings about uh, Bon Voyage when, when you know, maybe considered separately and together with Avant to Margash? Uh, do Do you like it just as well, or what's your take on on the Bon Voyage? Well, oh, I like both both of them. I think they're absolutely complementary. One was successful and was predictably successful. The other was a failure and was predictably a failure. And I have a feeling that Hitchcock didn't mind about that. I think he probably foresaw while he was making it. This film is is too difficult, going to be too difficult for the French. And sure enough. Uh, the, all, all of the diplomats thought, oh, we can't show this film. Um, it would be too divisive. And the French didn't want to show it. The British didn't want to send it to them. Uh, but, uh, oh, no, I, I'm very, I think Bon Voyage is an extremely neat job. And it was uh, with, with this lovely performance by Janique Joel, who was nearly 100 years old, and Alain, uh, found her alive and well and did this lovely interview with her. I've read it. It's really, it's really great. So uh, we should once again recommend uh, your book, um, Hitchcock Lost and Found. There is this uh, great interview testimony of working with Hitchcock and it can give you a taste of 
the atmosphere on the set, right? That was there at the beginning of 1944. Um, yeah. How how did it? How what was the method that Hitchcock used? Uh, actually, he was pretty selective, although you know he had limited resources both when it comes to. Uh, budget and actors, he really wanted her to to play in in Bon Voyage, right? And even when she had a, as far as I remember, some problem with her knee, right? He decided to yes. wait two days uh, for her. So and what is so endearing when you read this testimony by by um, Joel is that she didn't know that he's such a famous director, right? <laughs> That's the. Okay. So, you want me to say what I was going to say about um, J M Barry? Yes, please, please mm-hmm. do. Barry, uh, that he was, uh, I mean, most famous for Peter Pan, but uh, the play that really fascinated Hitchcock was uh, Mary Rose, which he wanted to make to the end of his life. And and the however many millions of pounds he had himself, he was uh, he, he was persuaded by the studio that he, he must never make it. Um, uh, and, you know, it's a very wistful, romantic play. You can understand how, how you wanted to make it. But but um, I'm also interested in the Barry play, The Admirable Crichton. Do you know that? Uh, no, no, no. When the... Um, it's a, sh- a shipwreck. Um, it, it's written early in the century, early in the 19th century, in the 20th century, and a shipwreck. And the... Um, it's uh, uh, an aristocratic family, uh, a lord, lord and um, a lord and his family and his servants uh, on the um, uh, boat, which is shipwrecked, and they land on a deserted island, and the butler takes over, uh, and by the end of a year or so, two years, uh, the butler is running the place, the servant, and the lord is uh, is, um, is has become his servant. The roles have been completely reversed. So sounds like a um, perfect part for Charles Lafton for to play the bu- butler. I guess. Like, <laughs> yes, it's, Cecil, Cecil Parker plays him in the film Cecil Parker from The Lady Vanishes and Under Capricorn. Good, very good casting. But anyway, uh, it was um, Hitchcock must have seen it because it was shown in his childhood. And there was a film of it in 1918, which I'm sure he must have seen. But this has come up because there's been some discussion lately of the centenary of a film which you won't have covered in your podcast, uh, Number 13. Wow. And it, Number 13 is a story about the servants become the masters. Sort of fantasy, a dream sequence. And I think that um, number 13 was inspired by that, and that that is a dimension that go, runs through Hitchcock's films. The, the, um, it sort of echoes something you were, one of you were saying just not long ago uh, about Hitchcock's kind of uh, radical take uh, on society and politics, sometimes deceptively so, that films like The Skin Game and and um, Jamaica Inn, uh, he's um, very, very critical of the, the British ruling classes and he was himself uh, often patronised and um, conscious of his, his status as a uh, as, a, as a Cockney from East London who hadn't been to university and with some Irish in him. And um, I think uh, there's, a, um, there's work to be done on, on J.M. Barry and Hitchcock, even though he never actually made a Barry film, but he, he started his career, as it were, with the Admirable Crichton and that idea of his, for his very first film, which wasn't finished. And then he finished up wanting to make Mary Rose with Tippi Hedren, but mm-hmm. couldn't. Mm-hmm. Speaking of Barry, that's uh, a question I would lo- love to uh, ask you. How much of a Victorian Hitchcock was? As, who, was there a, a Victorian type of, of, of sensibility, of character? Do, can, can you see him as a, as a Victorian filmmaker, I would say? As a historian? Vic- Victorian, like like from Victorian. the Victorian era. from the uh, yes. Oh, in, so, in some ways, yes. Mm. Uh... Yes, sort of Dickensian. Dickensian, okay. The kind of, uh, 
a, a rather kind of larger than life Dickensian figure. Okay. Um, he's got in himself that the way he dressed, the way he his build, etc. He he was a sort of Dickensian figure, and he was also uh, had this awareness of different levels of society to come out. Uh, I, I was listening to your podcast on the lady vanishes and i think that comes out very well the different levels of of society which are in play in in, in the train and that's the sort of the kind of thing that dickens had and other writers too of course of the victorian period mrs gaskell um notably um how much hitchcock read of them i'm not sure he he had a complete set of shaw didn't he george bernard shaw but he's post-victorian mm. But I think that's uh, you've got you've got so many different themes you've mm -hmm. you've you've raised there, including the Victorian one. Yeah. Um, I have one question which really uh, struck me in your essay as very interesting idea of you mentioned the uh, the transition on the one hand the aesthetic one from let's say this montage style to uh, long takes, but also you and I think I I haven't read much about it. It's I, for me it's a new idea that. Hitchcock was actually, you mentioned, you, you say something like that you cannot overestimate the impact of him be, being engaged in um, documentary about camps, concentration camps, his exposure to war atrocities. And we mentioned that his war movies are very sour. They, they never, maybe except for... Uh, foreign, foreign correspondent they do but even even there right we have there's this, no idealism yeah there's no idealism and they they do not fit neatly into into propaganda so my question is do you i mean could you maybe explore it a bit do you think that he was really changed as a filmmaker because it's kind of a cliche right that we i know that goddard associates that with hollywood filmmakers like george stevens that they were exposed to world war ii atrocities and their style changed somehow after the war or john houston and there's all this story do you think hitchcock also is one of these who who became darker filmmakers after the war or maybe not maybe he was always more or less disillusioned uh, about humanity well i think i think that is is a difficult question because hitchcock Th those 1930s thrillers are very committed. They're very committed films, aren't they? Uh, they're, they're, they're strongly anti-Nazi films. Mm -hmm. I think the more we, um, you, you can't get away from the fact that The Lady Vanishes especially is a, a strongly, urgently anti-Nazi film. And then then all that is is reinforced by his experiences during the war and sharpened and particularly with his work on the concentration camp footage clearly it had a big impact on him and he was going to make a, there was this fascinating suggestion that they were going to make the film of the last days of hitler mm -hmm. and then hitler comes into the dialogue of rope in the longer run i'm i'm not sure mm -hmm. um I can see see what the argument is with uh, Stevens and um, and Weiler, Ford, all of them much more directly involved than Hitchcock was in in seeing some action. Well, uh, th this has been wonderful from start to finish. Thank you so much. It's been a great honor, a great honor, and a great pleasure to talk to you. So, um, are there um, any other new, any new Hitchcock projects that you are? Uh, uh, cooking up for for us uh, just um, the last question yeah, I've, I've, <laughs> i'd like to write something on hitchcock and ireland and i try i had some lines um to pursue possibly in the west of ireland trying to go there's one of two places where his grandfather was born and i want to uh find out if if it's possible to track his grandfather down to one of these remote west of ireland famine affected mm -hmm. places so so um uh, possibly Hitchcock and Ireland, but I, I think, um, you know, I'm very flattered by what you say about, about my work, thank you, but equally I'm very interested in the fact that you, you two between you, with, with your, uh, as you keep saying, uh, as, as, as Poles, but with great understanding, obviously, of English and American culture and language, uh, that you have your own uh, work in progress um, on Hitchcock and long may it continue. And thank you very much for doing all the, the podcasts and thank you very much for inviting me. 
Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Please have a wonderful day and let's stay in touch. Let's stay in touch. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. So we're back. And this was a wonderful adventure for us, Aventure uh, uh, Varsovie. Uh, <laughs> so it was it was really great. I, I have to say I'm thrilled. Uh, thank you for much, uh, so much for, to Sebastian because he arranged it. But I have to say, uh, which Sebastian mentioned at the beginning, that it was actually Professor Barr who reached out to us, uh, um, making some very nice comments about our podcast. And that was just a real honor. So... Uh, next time we will discuss a film called Spellbound, so we'll be full in, let's say, most mainstream Hitchcock mode. Any closing thoughts on those two films and our conversation with uh, Charles Barr? Just the last thought that I didn't have time to, to share with you, uh, actually we're thinking about this topic that Charles Barr brought up in his essay and in, his, in, in, in this conversation, Hitchcock and race. Uh, sounds like... Uh, let's say uh, mainstream notion now to study famous directors and their approach to, to race and gender of course we we all do that or all scholars do that but in this case i think it was it was a very fresh approach and there is still as as you mentioned about geopolitics i think there's still book to be written about this uh, this element of Hitchcock filmography um, and yes, it was it was a great pleasure, and I was I, I had great pleasure to revisit these films. Actually, we didn't have time to share our our um, emotions and our opinions about this film, but I think they really uh, hold up very well. Maybe they are the best uh, Hitchcock war films, except for Foreign Correspondent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's definitely a treat to just to see those films because they are obscure, they are you know unusual for many many reasons, and we hope that this episode gave you some more insight and context to appreciate both Aventure Malgache and Bon Voyage. And uh, what can we say? Uh, we uh, are already preparing our next episode, which will focus on Spellbound, a lavish David O. Selznick production, which is a film about insanity, about psychoanalysis, but it's also a film that's quite insane and a film that probably could use some psycho analysis but uh, we will discuss this uh, next time on foreign correspondence deeper into hitchcock